so my name is Michael Wood. I've been doing WordPress development for about five years or so now. Um, I've been working, uh, well, a little side project I've been working on, uh, WPLib. Uh, you can go to WPLib.org and check that out. It's um, essentially an MVP uh, or object-oriented uh, programming, which that's what we're kind of getting into here uh, a little bit at a more basic level. Um, so if you want to check out some more of the advanced stuff, you can go take a look at that. And um, So that said, um, I believe my slides should have automatically posted on Twitter, WP Scholar, um, about five minutes ago. So if you wanted to uh, follow along, you can uh, that way, or if you, uh, what's that? Awesome. So, uh, and then my website, wpscholar.com, has a lot of um, stuff on there, and uh, I invite you to uh, send me a message if there's something you specifically would like to see on there as far as just helpful WordPress tips and, and that kind of thing. So, that said, we'll get started. We're going to start out nice and simple and see how, how we go. So, uh, so, basically, we're going to start out with something that is not PHP classes. So, uh, Hopefully everybody's familiar with PHP arrays and uh, uses them and understands kind of how they work. Uh, but I like to differentiate because not everybody knows uh, the difference. So I want to kind of explain some of those things. So an array is nothing more than a collection of values and sometimes it's an associative array where it has some sort of a key that's been specifically assigned to the value. Um, so it's common practice that if you wanted to be able to access something like the name of this product, that you would do something like this. And you would product, which is your variable, which is the array, brackets, and then in quotes the name of the thing that you want to fetch. On the other side, we have objects. So objects, um, PHP has something called a standard class object. Uh, so if you were, for example, to take that array we were just looking at uh, and, and cast it as a, an object, it would get converted into a standard class object. Um, but you can also create your, a standard class object in, in this type of manner. So we basically have the same data structure, but instead of being an array, we have it inside of an object. So you can see uh, the syntax for creating that is a little different, but ultimately it's the same data and we can get at it um, in a very similar fashion just by using this product arrow name. Simple enough. So beyond the standard um, standard class, uh, PHP standard class, uh, that PHP has, PHP has the ability for you to create your own classes of whatever uh, type you want. Uh, so essentially this is kind of where we need to differentiate uh, what an object is and what a class is. Because uh, a lot of times, people who aren't familiar, there's a big disconnect between, okay, you just mentioned objects, and now we're talking about classes, and I don't know what the difference is. So an object is nothing more than a collection. It, it's a data structure uh, that represents a particular item or thing, right? And a class is essentially nothing more than a blueprint for creating an object. So the class is the blueprint, uh, and classes are flexible in that you can build them and create them in whatever way you need to, to be able to do uh, what you want them to do. And then the object is essentially what that class ends up creating for you, and the data structures and, and things that are available to you off of that. So this is a basic class. Just use the word class, give it a name, little curly braces, and then um, you can put stuff inside of it. So at the most basic level, these are properties. So properties are essentially like variables. They're just inside of a class. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a little bit more to the definition. We use the word public here. Uh, whereas in PHP, if you were just assigning a variable, you do the dollar sign uh, variable and then assign it a value. Uh, so there is a small extra step there. And we'll go into more about what that public part actually means later. Uh, but ultimately, a property is nothing more than a variable that lives inside of a class. So, 
um, taking our class that we have here uh, and actually trying to use it, we, have, we do something called instantiation. So when you instantiate an object or a class, uh, when you instantiate a class, you create an object, basically, right? So think of it as a factory. Every time you uh, do this new product, you could assign a, it to a different variable, and you could have multiple of that same thing over and over. So you've, you've created a pattern or a blueprint through which you can create multiple, multiple objects uh, as you need them. And as you can see, um, we, in the same way as we did with a standard class, we are now assigning those same values to this thing here. So this, in, the, in what we're looking at, has little value over an array or a standard class object until we start adding in some of our own custom logic, which neither arrays nor the standard class that PHP provides will actually allow you to do. So with PHP, you can add a method, and a method is essentially a function that lives inside of a class. Uh, as you can see, uh, it also has uh, the public word here in front of it. So we have this method called discount. Uh, and what, and public is technically optional here. If you leave it off, it's assumed that you've used the word public, uh, but it's always good to be explicit. Uh, and again, we'll get into more about what those words specifically mean. Uh, but for simplicity, we now have a method called discount, which is a function, and it takes a parameter, which is the amount of the discount that you want to reduce the price by. And so as you can see, we're taking the price and reducing it by that particular amount. So key thing to note here is the dollar sign this. So that basically represents the class. It references the class. So anytime you do dollar sign this and the price, you're basically referencing the public property that's up here at the top. Now, the values you see up here at the top are just the initial values, so we can manipulate them uh, and they will change, but the class will obviously, by having that defined up top, will have that set as the default. You could technically leave off the, the values off of these properties up here and allow them to be set down here. Um, in our case, if we did that, then it's possible that a name or a price wouldn't have any value, and it would just return a null value. So we've added our method. Uh, we've added in the logic that allows us to man manipulate the variable. So if we have two products, we do a new product here, a new product here, so we've instantiated two instances of a product. Then ultimately, we can manipulate them separately using the discount method and have two completely different uh, data sets. One could have a very different price or a different name. Um, so as you can see, it's more of a blueprint, becoming more and more of a blueprint as we go. And so as you can see, in this example, we're instantiating a new product. Uh, we're setting a price. And then we're reducing the discount. And as you'll see, since we didn't specifically set the name, the name is actually still going to be empty. So in this particular example, uh, name could be overlooked in our programming and never get set. So we'd have a price for something that we don't know what it is. So this is where we have construct. Uh, so construct, yes. Yeah, so that is, um, so this, so it's essentially the same uh, syntax for if you have an object, um, the dash and then the greater than symbol uh, together. Uh, it allows you to access the properties, which are these things up here, uh, off of that particular object. And in this case, uh, because we're actually inside of the class that is creating the object, we use dollar sign this which represents the, the thing itself, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, the, on Twitter, follow the link on Twitter, because that'll take you there. The presentations, uh, it's not actually there yet, so it'll, it'll make its way there.
That's right. So yeah, so now we want to basically make sure that we have all the information set when we create a new object. So our class needs to say, hey, when you create a new instance, we're going to enforce the fact that we have both a name and a price for our product. So as you can see, we have this construct uh, method, and you see it starts with a double underscore. Um, in PHP, as a general rule, you can just make the assumption that if you see two underscores, uh, that you essentially have a magic something. <laughs> uh, now, the only exception to that is the double underscore, uh, well, actually, yeah, double underscore uh, translation function in WordPress. Uh, but if it's double underscore and something else, then essentially you've got uh, something in PHP that you can consider magical, right? Uh, so double underscore construct is basically a method that is run when you create a new instance of an object. There's also double underscore destruct, so that when that item gets destroyed, you can do any kind of cleanup that might need to happen. Uh, there's one that's double underscore to string. So if you wanted to be able to take an object and turn it into a string in some way, uh, like let's say if we wanted to do that with this product, we might say uh, name colon price or something like that. Uh, we could actually write a method that could do that. Uh, so then if I were to actually have this product as an object and say echo product, it would convert it to a string and output it in text form, uh, which can be very handy depending on what you're doing. Uh, matter of fact, uh, if you want a good example of that, uh, on my Bitbucket, uh, WP Scholar on Bitbucket, there is a HTML uh, li uh, manipulation library. It allows you to kind of create just one-off elements and work with them in easy ways. Um, but you'll see some of that kind of thing there if you need some good examples. So basically, as you can see down here at the bottom, uh, we're doing a new product, uh, and we're passing in the name and the price. Uh, and if we did not do that, then PHP would throw an error because it's expecting those things to come in. So when they do come in into our construct method, then we're assigning them to the name and price properties because uh, PHP doesn't do that for us. Um, we may not need them as properties, right? We might use them in other ways. So PHP makes no assumptions there. Um, but that's what we're doing, so we're just assigning it there. Uh, so if we, so I obviously couldn't fit our uh, discount method on, off on our uh, slide here, but making the assumption that that's still there, now everything is there, and when we use our uh, our discount method, it already knows now what the price is and can discount that particular item. So then we have something called inheritance. Um, and of course, every uh, example under the sun, they use the car example. So I felt like I should use some sort of car example. Um, <laughs> uh, so basically, we, what we have here are three different classes. Um, and they're tied together by this uh, class here at the top. So basically, what we have is a car, a generic car, uh, which then, in these classes down here, we are uh, taking the car class and making some changes or extending it. Uh, and as you can see in the, the thing here, we have a Toyota Highlander that extends car, meaning it is basically built off of and, it, and inherits all of the properties and the methods, which I didn't have room for, of that car class. And same thing with the, the Dodge Viper, right? So what we have here is a property called speed, which is zero. So in the instances of the Highlander and the Viper, the speed, even though it's not specifically mentioned in these other classes, is actually zero because it inherits that property from the car. So if we did also define some sort of a method like go, f go fast in this uh, car class, then it would also get inherited by these other two, um, two classes. And as you can see, we also have this top speed, which um, we use protected, I'll get into that. Uh, so we have a top speed property of zero on the car, and then on the, uh, the others it gets reset. So each, each instance of the Highlander and the Viper get their own top speed because obviously those are very different. Um, and I did look them up, those are the actual top speeds of those two vehicles, so. Uh, but 
you also notice the word abstract up here at the top, right? So a car in and of itself is so generic. Uh, can anybody tell me the top speed of a car, just in general? The, no, because it's just too generic. There's no real way that you can, can say, oh yes, the top speed of a car in general is this. Um, so it's too generic for us to really allow somebody to create a generic car instance because we want to have a more detailed instance. So what we've done is we said abstract, which means that you can't actually instantiate a car in and of itself. It has to be extended, um, such as in the Highlander or the Viper examples. So we can do new Highlander or new Viper, and it will create a new vehicle of that type. But there's, if PHP would not allow us to create a new car. Any questions on that? So inheritance, it, it basically all it would always really be used in a is a kind of thing, right? So a Toyota, Toyota Highlander is a car. A Dodge Viper is a car. So essentially the car is the blueprint um, that has to be extended by a very specific type, right? So, uh, so I have a... Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because because if I had a Toyota Toyota Highlander that for, had four hooves, I would be confused. <laughs> and but the computer, if it happened to inherit from the wrong thing, it could think that. So yeah. So it's definitely uh, yeah. You take your your car and you can define all of the generic things about a car. Uh, you know, wheel count, color, uh, whatever, um, manual versus automatic or something. Um, but again, you know, car in general can't really define those things specifically, so you have to have a specific, more specific instance to be able to define certain things. So that's what we're doing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, the, at these uh, public and protected as well as private um, properties. So public, protected, and private uh, have very specific meanings. Public basically means that um, if I instantiate a new object based off of this class and I try to fetch the speed property, because it's public, I can get it. If something is protected or private, then it's not accessible outside of the class. That, so if I instantiate the Dodge Viper class and I try to fetch the acceleration, um, because it's protected, I can't do that. If I tried to fetch the top speed, because it's private, I can't get it. Protected is a little more loose than private. Private is the most strict that you can get. Um, so as you can see, there's two classes here. We have the one up top, which has got some things going on, and the one down here at the bottom, which extends the one on the top. So we've got Dodge Viper as the specific class. We've got the Dodge Viper Venom as the more specific thing. Uh, so its acceleration is a little faster. And, uh, but as you can see, we're taking the protected acceleration and, uh, and adding it down here at the bottom and redefining it, right? So if it's protected, it means that any class that extends this has ability to access or override it. If it's private, then this class, any class that extends from that, has no access to it. So private quite literally means that it is contained to this Dodge Viper class, and no matter what you do, it can't be accessed from anywhere outside of that. Protected means that if you want to get the acceleration, you can do it from any class that extends from this base class. And if you wanted to access public, you can do it pretty much from anywhere. So there's a lot of stuff on this slide. Uh, first thing you'll notice is there is no abstract uh, keyword here at the beginning of this first class. Uh, that's because we have a specific instance. It's specific enough, Dodge Viper is specific enough that we can know what features we're dealing with. 
um, and we're extending it with something even more specific, but it's not so generic like a car that we can't, uh, we can't allow somebody to create one. So you could create a Dodge Viper, you could create a Dodge Viper Venom, and PHP would let you do that just fine. So you'll see our go fast uh, method here. So it's basically taking our speed and adding our acceleration, and uh, it's kind of a dumb uh, calculation and doesn't take into account a few things in physics, but whatever, um, it works. So, uh, so basically it just checks and says, hey, if you're trying to go faster than this car's top speed, we're going to bump you back down to top speed because that's as fast as you can go. Uh, so when you try to go fast, you can do it a few times until you reach top speed, and then that's it. You're just at top speed for the rest of the time. Um, unfortunately, you have no deceleration uh, method in here, so hopefully you're a good driver. Uh, but as you can see, there's a final word right here in front of go fast. And final basically means that while it is public and you can access it from outside of the class, because it is final, there's no, no way you can override that. So if I come into the Dodge Viper Venom and I try to make go fast, uh, break the rules of physics and go beyond its top speed, then I can't do that. So final, you can assign it to a method and then that method cannot be overridden by anything that extends it. You can also use it on the class so that the whole class cannot be extended or Yes, extended. So public is anybody can access. Protected means the child classes uh, can access. Private means only the class you're in can access. So then we have uh, static properties and methods. So, so in this case, there's something that you, uh, so basically you don't actually instantiate an object in this case. So this is, think of it more as a, uh, the class here is a container for functions um, of sorts. Uh, but it also has this data array here. So we, by using the keyword static, what that means is that when this class gets loaded, uh, this uh, static data property it already exists. It's set at whatever you've set it at. And these uh, functions, methods that you've added inside of this thing here, because they are now static, it means that they exist uh, and can be called directly uh, in a fashion like this down here, registry colon colon add, instead of having to create a new registry object and then, you know, uh, take whatever variable that was assigned to to your dash greater than sign and and try to work with methods or properties that way. So in this case, you can get direct access to those methods and because the data property there already exists, um, this these methods can interact with that property that already exists at any time. Um, so obviously, this is not uh, creating standalone objects now. This this is kind of a global uh, thing you can access globally. It doesn't take up global, uh, it's not like creating a global variable per se. Um, but you have global access to it and anything can act with it and interact with it. And you know, this module and this module interacting with the same class can affect each other. So, that, so obviously from the word registry, what we're doing here is we've got an array of data and we have a class or a method here that allows us to add data to it and a method here that allows us to remove data. So in this case we could add a SKU for a product and the name of it uh, and now it's in our registry. The one thing we are missing here is the ability to get <laughs> information. We can add and remove uh, but obviously we need a get method in there or you'll never actually see the data again. Uh, so, so this, this actually is a uh, common PHP development pattern. So if you're not familiar with it, um, one good thing to study is to go look up PHP patterns, design patterns. Uh, and registry is a design pattern that can be used. Um, uh, and I found very useful in some of the coding that I've done. Uh, but ultimately, typically you would have a, an add method, a remove method, 
a get so you can actually get the data, and then maybe a has method so you can check and see if something exists in the collection. Um, but it's an easy way of allowing modules and different components to talk with each other uh, by just checking to see if specific pieces of data exist, or maybe even entire modules exist. And one of the things I remember being very confused about when I first started working with classes and trying to get things to actually work, particularly in the case of WordPress, is uh, when you add an action uh, hook uh, or a filter, you have to define a callback, which is n very plain and simple when you're working with functions. It's just a string that contains the name of that function. But when you're working with classes, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, so the two items on the top here deal with classes that you instantiate, and the two here on the bottom deal with classes that are, uh, that are static, have static methods that you want to access. So if you've created an object that has to be instantiated, uh, then, and you're trying to add something, a callback, within that class, you can use the this to reference the current class, and then the name of the method you want to call, and you put it into an array in that format, and now you have a callable or a callback that you can assign to a WordPress action uh, or a filter. And this is not a WordPress thing, this is just a PHP thing. So that's just the way that call, callables work. Uh, and then, of course, that second line on the top section there is when you have an object that you've instantiated. Um, I'm just, as an example, using dollar sign instance to represent something, an object that has been created from a class. So you can pass in the object itself and then the method name and it'll work just the same way. On the bottom, we have double underscore class double underscore, which of course is magical, uh, which basically means that uh, if you are working statically, uh, that's how you would reference a static class from inside of itself. So it's basically saying we're inside of this class and instead of me actually putting the whole class name that I'm in, inside of this thing I can just use that uh, and it will know what it is. And of course down here on the bottom if you're working with static class or static methods um, and you're outside of that particular class you can just pass in the full name of the class and then the, the method name. So I try to think of the most basic example of, of something that you would be useful in WordPress. That would be a kind of a good example of um, using, using these types of things. So this is what I came up with. So it's a class I call post content appender, right? So from the name, it's very obvious. You want to add something onto the end of a post content, of, onto the end of a post's content. Uh, so what we basically got is we got a property called append, which is the thing that you want to append to the content. Uh, it's protected because once it's been set, uh, you shouldn't be able to mess with it. Uh, we have a public construct function that allows you, when you instantiate the post content appender, to put whatever you want to be appended in there. So as you can see on the bottom, my appender, uh, I'm creating a new post content, content appender, and I'm passing in the paragraph posted by Michael Wood, which will now show up on the bottom of all my posts. Um, so once that hits the construct, the append uh, variable gets assigned to the append property. And then we are adding an action. Uh, so the construct should do all the setup of a class, um, but you really don't want to do any real work inside of that. You want to you allow that to happen elsewhere. So, uh, so this is just setting, setting the the stage for what needs to happen. So we're adding the action, the content, and then you'll see an example of our callable. Since we are in a class that has to be instantiated, uh, we are using the dollar sign this, and then the name of the thing that we want to call, which is append content. And you can see that append content is public so that it can be called from outside of the class. This is very important when you're working with WordPress, because if you were to make that protected or private, WordPress itself wouldn't be able to call your callback, uh, and so this would fail, right? 
So anything that WordPress has to be able to call via callback, you want to make sure it's public or WordPress won't be able to, to call it. And then basically the append content just takes the content and it returns you the content plus whatever needs to be appended. And so now, um, because you've added the filter, it will append to the content. Now, if you wanted to, for example, remove this action, um, you could do that as long as you have an instance of uh, your little appender down here, right? So I could do, if I wanted to somewhere else in the code, remove this action and cause it not to append to the content, uh, then I could take my append variable and in, use it in the place of the dollar sign this and create another line of code somewhere else that says remove action, the content, and it has that array format for the callable, and we pass in appender, append content, and it will actually remove that action. So that is the bulk of what I have. I have a few things to discuss if no one has questions, but I'm sure there's probably some questions. So. Questions? So, yeah, so as far as making something private, um, I've rarely ever used that. A lot of people use private thinking they're doing the same thing as protected, um, but then you get in a situation where you try to extend that class that they've created and you can't do that because the thing that you want to change is protected. So, or I'm sorry, private. So, um, so usually, usually I go with the most uh, lax thing that I can unless I know for sure that I want to make it more secure or protect it more from people being able to change it. Um, but to be honest, when, I think when I first start developing something, I just set things as public um, until I realize that, hey, you know, if a developer that didn't know what was going on could screw this up, I should probably make that more secure. Um, a lot of times though for just projects that I do, um, I know that I'm the only one that's even aware that the code's there. <laughs> I just make it public and it works. Um, so, but there's, there's kind of a few different patterns of thought, right? So if I make something protected, um, then I cannot set nor get it from outside of the class. Um, and so then maybe I'm doing the work of uh, setting that up inside of the construct uh, method. Now if I do that, that means that there's a lot less flexibility in terms of being able to test that because now we're doing work and setup that's just happening automatically um, that we may or may not want to do if we had to test certain things related to the class. So, um, so there's times to do it, there's times not to do it. Kind of really just depends on what you're trying to do, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I, I usually try to make it... Uh, I start out at the lowest level and work my way up. And I rarely ever use private, to be honest. So I just make sure you use protected instead of private and that you don't get confused and make it private when you think you're <laughs> making it protected. Um, well, so, yeah, well, that's a good point. So, um, so really, I mean, in terms of WordPress, uh, most of the way that you interact with WordPress is actually in those actions and filters. Um, so, so basically, a lot of times in WordPress, you see people who write uh, 
they essentially use classes as uh, namespaces, right? So maybe they'll have a bunch of static methods inside of a class. Uh, and it's basically just a container in a place where they can namespace everything. Uh, and maybe they'll have a, something they call that, that adds all the, the, uh, the hooks and such. Um, which works. I mean, it, it works. It gets the job done. Um, but because of that, uh, I think, because of the way that I guess it's commonly used in WordPress, uh, a lot of people miss the fact that uh, essentially there's a lot more power to that than is being used, right? So if I need to create a specific, uh, uh, well, let's take for example, uh, they switched from having uh, posts, uh, the, the post object in WordPress, from being a standard class to being an actual object uh, or class, a WP post class in WordPress. So when they made that transition, it went from just a collection of uh, pieces of information directly from the database to something that add a little bit more interactivity, right? So for example, and this is one of the bonuses that hopefully uh, um, everyone can appreciate. Um, so classes have, uh, and this is kind of a little bit more advanced, so I didn't want to throw it out and confuse a bunch of people, but um, speaking of magic, right, you can do double underscore get, you can do double underscore set, and essentially what that is is a method that allows you to control uh, the interaction that the user or the developer who's writing the code has with the properties on that object or that in that class. So, um, so a getter allows you to process the request for a specific property and return something based off of some logic. So WP Post, for example, if you are trying to request a property that doesn't exist, it would then go in, it actually does uh, get post meta. And it will return, if it finds something in the database that happens to match that name, return that value. So essentially, now that we have the WP Post object, you have virtual properties. So instead of having to, when you, anytime you have a post object in WordPress, instead of having to do get post meta, post ID, key name, true, then now you can just do post dash greater than name of meta that you want to get, and it will do it. Um, question. Sometimes I've, I've seen when I'm using plugins that use like classes and stuff, they've made it so convoluted that it's hard. Uh, it, have, you, have you seen that where like you can use classes for really long and uh, like to the point where you should have just like used some of those for the other? Right. Exactly. So, and that's that's the thing about object-oriented programming that can get very difficult is uh, when you first start doing it, you're just so excited about the fact that you have this new power and control that you just go wild and create these giant things. Uh, a lot of times you hear the, the term like God class, right? It tries to do everything under the sun. Um, so, so there's a, a lot of best practices that go along with the tools that we're presenting here. Um, so you hear the word solid in relationship to object-oriented programming, which is, you know, has, is an abbreviation that has a bunch of different rules, one of which is the... Um, the single uh, responsibility rule. So basically saying that if you create a class, it's meant to do one thing, right? It's kind of like plugins. Like people go create plugins and they'll create such huge options pages that they become virtually impossible to use uh, and do so much that they become just things that people don't want to install. Um, so same idea, you know, you use your code incorrectly and just go wild and have no sense of purpose to it, then yeah, nobody's really going to want to use that code or work with that. And it's going to be extremely hard to maintain, probably worse than if you just use functions. But when you can, you know, put everything in, use the single responsibility rule and say, okay, this class does one thing. It appends stuff to the content and that's all it does. Then obviously you can see we have very clean uh, code and with one line of code, I can now append anything I want to the end of a post. So, yeah. Question. So, would you review what's the best practice for linking your classes? Is there a best practice for registering your classes? And by register, you just mean to include them in, into there? Um, yeah, that's a talk that I've given many times. Uh, Composer is my preferred way of 
getting bits and pieces of code that I've written before and reuse over and over and over again uh, into a project. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to wpscholar.com and look at my presentations and find a composer talk that I've done um, on how that works. Um, but yeah, as far, and, and it's kind of a common practice in the PHP world, right? So uh, being able to create essentially a manifest or a JSON file that contains a reference to uh, the code that you want to add and the exact version at which you want to add it. And uh, that way you're not including third-party code into your project directly, but you're including a reference to it so it can be loaded in when you're releasing it to production. So. Um, despite uh, best intentions and as much study uh, as you may do up front, if you actually do it, you're probably not going to do it right. <laughs> uh, it's my personal opinion. Um, most people learn by doing, and uh, you know, intellectually, I guess we could we could we could take it all in. But until you get messy, with the code, um, I don't think anybody does it right. But, um, so for me. Um, I found it helpful to, there's a, there's a book called uh, PHP Design Patterns. Um, I found that helpful in that it helped, because the patterns are based off of some of the best practices, um, it gives you good examples that you can, you can take and use. Now, technically, you know, anytime you use something directly from a book, you know, you're, you should adapt it to fit your needs, uh, but it gives you a good starting point, a good thought process at looking at common things that you might need to do in PHP and be able to adapt your code to fit uh, exactly what you need in a way that is not, hopefully not going to be too messy. So. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, appreciate you coming and we'll see you later.